Beautiful. That actually worked out well. Well, first of all, thank you very much for everyone coming tonight. Um, I wanted to start off actually with my first introduction to Francois was about two years ago. And I read a line from one of his papers, and at the time it struck me because it seemed so obvious. He was describing an approach to intelligence, and it seemed so straightforward, but at the time, it was contrarian, and it's still kind of contrarian, but it underpins a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is why I wanted to share it with you for us to first start. So Francois, in his paper in 2019, On the Measure of Intelligence, he opened it up, very first sentence, in the abstract, and said, to make deliberate progress towards more intelligent and more human-like artificial systems, which I think a lot of us in this room are either building towards that or investing towards that, we need to be following an appropriate feedback signal. We need to be able to define and evaluate intelligence. Now, when you first hear that, it's like, duh, of course, that's exactly what we gotta be doing. But it turns out that that's actually not how most of the industry is thinking about it right now. The, co the common theme in the industry is if we're gonna measure intelligence, we're gonna keep on coming up with harder and harder problems. We're gonna make PhD++ problems and keep on testing folks in these, in these narrow domains. Now, what you're actually measuring this is you're gonna be measuring skill with that. So you have a lot of practice at a certain domain and then you go and demonstrate masterful skill in that domain. But in Francois's paper, he went a step further and he made an actual proposal for what he defined intelligence as and that was your ability to efficiently adapt to novelty. That's kind of a mouthful, so in another more simple way, it basically says, how quickly can you learn new things? And that's a key distinction I wanna make on this one here. So we're not gonna be measuring skill, but really we're gonna be measuring your ability to learn something new. My name is Greg Camrad, president of ArcPrize. We're a nonprofit with the mission to act as a North Star towards open AGI. We were founded by Francois Chalet and Mike Knoop last year. And as an organization, we build benchmarks that measure the generalization and intelligence of artificial systems. What you see tonight and what you might have already played is actually uh, a preview of something we're gonna show you tonight. It's under embargo until tomorrow at 10 a.m. So if you could please hold off on sharing until tomorrow at 10 a.m., that would be fabulous. You'll see a lot of noise from us on Twitter when you do. Um, so as an organization that makes benchmarks, there's, there's a lot of those out there, but we have a very opinionated approach as to how we make ours. And our core design philosophy, our core design principle for ArcPrize is we love problems that are easy for humans, but hard for AI. And the reason why we love these problems is because as long as we can still come up with these, it shows us that there's a gap. And there's a gap in capability about what humans can do and what AI can do. And we anchor on humans because it, humans are our only proof point of general intelligence. And it makes sense to me that if you're trying to recreate general intelligence uh, artificially, then you would start with your biological existence proof that you have. Now, I wanna take it back to Francois's paper on the measure of intelligence. Not only did he define intelligence, but he also defined a test to measure whether or not you could learn new things. And that was where the start of ARC AGI-1 came around, and I wanna show you an example of it here. So ARC AGI-1, you can kind of think of it as a little bit of a meta question because each question is divided into two pieces. Our goal is to teach you a mini skill and then we want to see, can you demonstrate that skill that we just taught you? Because if so, you've successfully learned a small or a mini skill within a narrow domain here. On the left, this is a um, ARC task problem. On the left, we have the learn the skill piece. So what we show is we show you an input and an output and an input and an output. And your goal as the test taker, whether it's human or whether it's AI, is to look at the transformation and say, well, what do I think is going on here? And you can see here that we have a, uh, a line extending out the top of the pyramid in both examples, and the color and the positioning uh, matters here. Now, the test taker, human or AI, you need to fill in the test piece. And this is the apply the skill portion. And what we'll do here is we'll say, okay, in order to demonstrate that you've learned this, go and fill out the new grid that shows that you can successfully recreate this transformation. And if you've done it, then yes, you successfully showed us the new skill that you've learned. Now, this is from ArcAGI1. ArcAGI2, our most recent benchmark, has over 1,300 tasks in it. And the important part with this is each one of those tasks is novel and unique from each other. So there are no two tasks that will ask you to extend a line outside the top of the pyramid based off the color. 
And that's a very specific design choice because if we did that, you'd just be learning that skill once and then repeat and then repeat and then repeat and repeat. We already know if you've demonstrated it once, you can do it again for us. Uh, one of the things that makes, such a, makes a really good arc task, if you think about it as an embedding space, we want arc tasks to be very different from each other. So we want the maximum distance from an embedding standpoint if you were to put each one of these on a chart here. Uh, it's actually one of the main reasons why we can't procedurally generate arc tasks because each one of these is made by a person and a human so that we're able to insert the G of the human into each one of these tasks. And we're also able to deduplicate and validate that each one is different from each other because, well, if you could use AI to deduplicate, you're probably halfway to solving them in the first place. Now that we have these two, two tools as an organization, we have two goals as an organization. Goal number one is to provide a useful signal to researchers. And we do that through highlighting the gap of what humans can do, our proof point of general intelligence, and what AI cannot yet do. And that gap says, hey, there's something missing over here that we need to go research and more highlight from there. Now, the second goal that we have is to provide a useful sense-making benchmark for the public. And with, that, um, with the benchmark that we have, we're able to measure progress on the frontier and allow transparent um, reporting about where frontier models are. Now, with these goals, I wanted to share some of the progress that the ArcPrize team is very proud of over the past six months. In December 2024, just last year, we were invited by OpenAI to join them as their highlight marquee benchmark. We joined them live in person to co-announce the results on ArcPrize with O3 preview model. And so here we are, here we are with Sam and Mark. And then just last week, we were contacted by XAI to be the highlight benchmark that they also communicated their Grok 4 performance on. So these are frontier labs making a very strong statement, highlighting ARC in such a way, saying that this is how we choose to communicate how our model performance is doing here. And it's not just frontier labs, but we have a lot of public support as well. So we have a huge Kaggle community that is currently competing to try to beat ARC AGI uh, 2. And there's over probably about, Last year, we had about 1,500 teams participate in this, and so a huge public support from this. One of my favorite pictures here is in the bottom right. That's actually the architects, the winners of the 2024 competition. And you can see, maybe hard to see, but they're repping their ARC t-shirts as well that they've made for themselves. We did not make those. <laughs> now, with the support, this is great, but another question we have is, if we take a look at the last 12 months, what can we learn about the Frontier AI through ARC? So taking it back to the beginning, we saw that ArcAGI 1 came out in 2019, and this was, um, th this was ArcAGI 1. Now, in late 2024, when we co-announced results with O3 Preview, ArcAGI was able to mark the exact moment that AI moved beyond the pure pre-trained scale. So this is when we saw reasoning models make a step-level qualitative change within their performance. And we saw these results exactly in ARC AGI. ARC AGI was mostly flat, more or less, with base LLM models, and then absolutely showed signal as to when reasoning came about. Now, um, what we say is ARC AGI 1, this was really a challenge to deep learning, right? Now, in the beginning of 2025, we came out with ARC AGI 2. And what this was able to do is this was able to demonstrate how quickly you could get to state of the art as a frontier lab by demonstration of XAI bringing Grok online as quickly as they did. So we say that ARC AGI 2 is a challenge to static reasoning. And we say static reasoning because more or less we're going from top to down in a linear fashion uh, more or less from here. But there's still an open question around, well, what does this mean for the future of where AI is going? And if we go from deep learning to static reasoning, what's coming up next? And I think all of us have felt the vibe in the room here. Uh, things are moving towards interactive. Things are moving towards agents that you talk to, agents that go off and gather information and gather feedback and go back and forth. And so we really need a tool that's gonna to be able to challenge interactive reasoning for us. That's not just static reasoning. And what's kind of interesting is we've seen some tools already organically pop up that try to do this. So I don't know if you saw the other day, but you know, Gemini 2.5 Pro beat Pokemon. And there's little AGI robots floating around. I think it's a little too early to call that. Um, but these are actually early attempts at tools to try to evaluate agents in a certain type of environment, right? Now, there's plenty of um, issues with using Pokemon here, but they are starting to actually tell us something even early on. So there's also Claude plays Pokemon. And even with a very generous scaffold, so we're talking about uh, a scaffold and a test harness that had plenty of developer intelligence built into it, and even with plenty of training data in Claude about Pokemon, it's still getting stuck in the same place for three days straight. 
So it is telling us, yes, even with a rudimentary tool like Pokemon as an environment, it's still telling us something about, the reason, about where reasoning models currently are. Now, if we're gonna take this further, well, we need a more robust tool to do this. And one of the key things that I love from the Pokemon or the Cloud Place Pokemon era is that you get a lot of net new capabilities when you move from a static benchmark, meaning just the question in and out, and you move to an interactive benchmark. So you get a, a lot of new uh, capabilities to go and measure. So with an interactive benchmark, you can test a model's ability to explore its environments. Now, of course, this, that's a bit of an academic way to put it, but just imagine you're building a product and you're putting an agent into a new environment, whether it be a company, whether it be a code base, or whatever it may be. Right now, it's very difficult to measure how well it explores from there. You're able to measure an agent's ability to perceive, plan, and go and act. And then one of my favorite ones is, well, what about everything an agent learned in the past? How is it gonna be applying that forward? So you're able to attest, uh, test its memory, also goal acquisition. And then an, a very interesting one, too, is you can start to manufacture different types of environments that test alignment and cooperation within agents as well. And so say in order to exit an environment, you must demonstrate alignment and cooperation. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of axes of freedom that we have here uh, if we are able to do this. So if we're going to build this, we need a new category of benchmark that we don't currently have right now. And that category is interactive reasoning benchmarks. And if we think about what is the medium in which we want to deploy an reason, uh, interactive reasoning benchmark, well, actually, games are a beautiful medium for this. And the reason why is because games have a very uh, clear set of rules. They have sparse rewards that don't immediately tell you if you're going the right direction. They um, require uh, interactive to be able to, to play with them. And they also require complex planning in order to actually finish the game, all right? So if you could build a benchmark, an interactive reasoning benchmark, that an agent was able to successfully beat, then you could determine its exploration, you could tell, determine its world model building, you could determine um, could it uh, remember the novelty that it had seen in the past and start to manufacture these types of environments. So I'm very excited to say that this is exactly what ArcPrize is gonna be building here. And today you're seeing a preview of Arc AGI 3. The preview will launch, like I said, tomorrow at 10 a.m., so under wraps until then. Arc AGI 3 will be cha uh, challenging interactive reasoning, and we're announcing three things tonight. So number one is we're announcing our first six games. Now, I call these games just to communicate, but really you can think of these as different environments that are completely novel from each other. We'll look at a few in a second here. Number two is, as an organization, we built our first piece of infrastructure. So we're actually hosting an API, we have our game engine, and you can interact with these environments with yourself or with the agents just via the API. And then lastly, we're also hosting a 30-day agent competition. But we'll go over more about this in just a second here. So to kick us off, the first three games. Now, all these three games, they're, uh, they're playable around the computers today. So if you want to go try these out, you can go and do them. The important part I want you to take away from this is that each one of the games is novel from each other. What I mean by that is they won't have some little agent in every single one that you're going through. What we want to do is we want to test the test taker's ability, whether it's AI or whether it's humans, to adapt to new game mechanics on the fly. So some will have agents, some will require elementary logic, and then the last one over here is actually quite interesting. It's actually kind of an orchestration type of thing. It's no logic, it's no uh, agentic, but you have to orchestrate from there. Uh, the next thing that we're launching, uh, number two, is we're going to be launching the API. So this is where you can go test, train, and evaluate your agents, and this makes it really easy to go test public models too. And as we are uh, making this benchmark, there's a natural question, which is, well, where's the frontier of AI right now? And so we thought, all right, well, what are the best models we can put at it? And we picked O3 High, and we picked Grok 4. And here's one of the games uh, that it was, they were both trying to go after. <laughs> there's not a lot happening. Um, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's on a loop from here. Um, <laughs> the, what I want to emphasize here is that the scaffold that we used to it uh, didn't hint at any instructions. We didn't give it any nudges on what it should do or what it should think about. But this is what the frontier of AI looks like right now when it's dropped into an unknown environment. And so even if we were to use Claude plays Pokemon and Gemini plays Pokemon as a signal, even something like this shows um, we have a long way to go before uh, agentic AI is going to be exploring new environments. And lastly, what we're launching is we're going to be launching a 30-day agent competition. And the reason why we label this a preview release is because we're launching actually pretty early. We're not expected to come out with a full benchmark until probably 
2026 at some time. I don't want to commit to a date quite yet. But we want to learn from the community. Not only do we want to learn about our API design and our hypothesis, but we really want feedback on our game design and how well are we making these games and the mechanics of that or how we're thinking about it and the ramp up and the levels and everything. And so we want to elicit uh, energy from the community. And so we're hosting a mini 30-day competition. We'll put up a little bit of prize money for it. Um, and folks can get started with a few templates that we have and, and, and go from there. What we learn with this competition is actually, this is gonna help us design the next 100 games that we end up doing. And if we wrap it up for where we're at with RKGI3, so it'll eventually be about 100 games in uh, 2026, next year. And our, the way I like to put it is our acceptance criteria for RKGI3. And what I mean by acceptance criteria, I mean we won't let it out unless this is true. We will not let out this benchmark unless it is the widest gap possible in demonstrating what is the difference between humans and AI. So to put that another way is, we will take a known proof point of general intelligence and our current frontier state of AI, and we will have the widest gap possible to not only say, hey, we have a long way to go, but also there's something missing and we need to guide more research over here. Because as long as we have that gap, it will not only tell us that, yep, we don't have AGI, um, but, <laughs> but yeah, there's a long way to go for that. <laughs> um, my only CTA for everybody in the room tonight is go play the games. Um, that's the best thing that you can do for us. Go play the games. You can play them on your phone. I will admit there are going to be a little bit better on desktop, but absolutely go play them on your phone. And then share the progress or share screenshots or whatever it may be tomorrow at 10 a.m. That would be the biggest help for us. Because the more eyes that we can get on this, the more feedback we can get on it, which is going to help us build the benchmark uh, up in the future there. That's all we have for tonight. <laughs>